Good morning, church. It's a great day to be in the Lord's house this morning. Let's all stand at this time, shake hands with those around you, make our guests feel welcome, and they'll worship for a little bit. precious in our sight. We stand in awe of your grace, of your mercy. We stand, Heavenly Father, in honor because as the great creator and the maker of all things, your love has reached down to us, your mercy poured out, and your grace when we didn't deserve it. Even while we were yet sinners, your son, Jesus, died for us. We come together, gather together in his name for your purpose to hear from you, to glorify you, to honor you. We pray that you just draw us to thy throne of grace. Let everything that we do and say point to, to you during this time. Let us as one join together, opening our hearts and our minds, trusting, trusting you. That you would be honored, glorified, and praised. And when we leave this place, our lives will be changed. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're glad that you're here. You can be seated. We're glad that you're here this morning. It's good to see you. If you're visiting with us in front of you, there is a little card that is there for you to fill out to let us know information about you. That is not for us to track you down. We would like to let you know that we're available. We're here for you. And if we can help you in any way, call upon us. But we're here to serve, and that's what that card is for, to help us to be able to, to serve you. As church members, there's a place for prayer request. We don't just stop and take a time when we call out prayer requests as we're together. But if you would like for the staff to know something, if you have a special prayer request, put it down there. The staff will all see it. If you want the whole church to know it, we'll make it known to everybody. But it, that is for each and every one. If you take that, fill it out, put it back in the offering plate. This is a special time in the life of our church. Anybody know what's going to take place this week? Somebody back here said it. There's a Nicaragua trip. How many of you realize that we've got four individuals going on mission this week to Nicaragua? 
Would you four individuals stand up? I, I, I'm starting to say just come right down here. Okay. There's three of them. There's the fourth one. <laughs> You're hiding back there. <laughs> Let's stop for just a moment. And I'm going to ask that if Russell will, he would pray for these. We as a church are sending these out. They're representing us as though they go to Nicaragua. They're carrying our name. But they're also going to the uttermost parts of the world as Greenbrier Road Baptist Church in carrying out the mission that God has given us. And so it's great significance. We go with them. We need to be praying for them throughout this week. They leave on Friday, and they'll be there for a full week, and then they'll be coming back. And so as the Lord brings them to mind, you may be the one individual that God brings them to mind during the next week and a half, two weeks, that no one else is, but that may be the one moment and the one time that that person or this group they're in a special need, and God puts it on your heart to pray for them, and you get them through. <clears throat> you get them through. And so let me encourage you to pray for them. But Russell, will you pray for them as we commit them to the Lord in sending them out? I want to do something unusual because he pulled a lot out on me and asked me to pray for them. <laughs> so uh, those are uh, coming in the next while. We got them down here. And those that feel led, you um, might to physically come up and lay hands on them. We're going to lay hands on them and pray for them. But if you feel led to do so, uh, please come on up and join us. If not, you feel free to say who you are and then uh, come with us to the as well. I realize this is out of ordinary. We've interrupted our order of service for something very important. I can speak the gospel. Like that. <laughs> They're recording it. Oh. You're in front of the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask uh, your divine hand upon these that you've called to go to Nicaragua, Father. We ask that you just pray for them. Uh, Lord, lift them up. As we lift them up, we lift them up to you, Father, that you would just put your hand of protection on them, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, grant them your mercy and your grace as they deliver the gospel message for others, Father. You call them out from here, Father. You called us all out to get out of our comfort zone, Lord, and, and go to our communities and to our homes and to our workplaces, Father, to share your gospel message with others, Father. Father. So we thank you that these four have been called because they've been called out of the many here at Greenbrier, Father. You've called just a few to go. But we ask, Father, that, that uh, during this process, Father, that you would bring life change to those that they speak the gospel message to. That your Holy Spirit would just infuse those around them, Heavenly Father. That they would come to know you, Father, because that's the most important thing. Whether it's a dollar that we've given or $10 or $100 or no matter what the cost is, Father, the cost is that you sent these few to share the gospel to change lives forever, Father. That they would come to know you and be in heaven and have eternal life with you, Father. To grow with you, Father. And just the one person that they may touch, Father, may be the next evangelist that touches a thousand or ten thousand, Father. So we can't just sit back and say, well, it's just going to save eight or nine people, Lord. No, those eight or nine people or how many ever that come uh, to know you, Father, will multiply, multiply into thousands, Heavenly Father. We ask that you just continue to be with those that are here and, and just in our daily walk, Father, as, as uh, it comes to, to our mind, Father, may we we continue to pray for those that, uh, that go to Nicaragua, Father. We ask that you just continue to be with their families that are here, Lord. May they not worry or grow anxious about what's going to take place because we know that they are in your hands, Father. Continue to bless us as a church that we would uh, take this opportunity as a sign of inspiration, Father, not just for the, the missions in Nicaragua, but the missions here in Aniston and in Oxford and in our community, too, that we can be a daily missionary to share those outside of Greenbrier. Continue to bless us, Father, and give us discernment in everything that we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Thank you. As you will stand as we continue in worship together this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. I was breathing 
Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name Shine. 
songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptation.
your suffering in our lives, Father. We can give you praise because we're in a win-win situation, Father. Whether we live or we die, we're with you eternally, Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and the work that you just played on the cross when he gave his life as a ransom for us, Father, and died in our place. What a beautiful name it is. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for this time of worshiping together. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, choir. Your leadership and guidance each week in leading us to worship. I, I miss the pulpit. It's back somewhere in the back, and hopefully by next week I'll try to get it here. Uh, our times have come to where the Word of God is not central, but to me, the pulpit itself has a picture and it's a significance there that we come and the center of things is the Word of God. It's not our music. It's not our worship. But the center of things is the Word of God. It's God. Jesus. Jesus said that He is the Word. The Word Himself. He was in the beginning. He was made. He made all things. And the Word is central, and the Word is the focus of it all. And it's something about a pulpit, and especially one that's shaped like a cross. I looked around, and in looking around to see if we had another cross anywhere else in our sanctuary. And yet, the central focus of the gospel is the cross. We have a baptistry that is open and that is the significance many times of the empty grave because we serve a risen Savior. We do not serve a dead Savior. There is a tomb that is empty and we're the only religion that can say that. But we serve a living Savior and He is the central focus of it all. You're going to get tired of going there, but because of the truths that are there and the way I want to go, go back to Acts chapter 2. And I'd like to back up and begin with not verse 42, but begin with verse 41 this morning. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. And then you'll be able to flip over to Acts chapter 4, adding two verses to what I read last week. Last week we stopped to consider if we're going to be impact the nation that we live in. If we're going to see change, it's got to begin within. We as the church have got to be filled with God's presence. It's not that He just dwells there, but we have got to be filled with His power. He has got to be in control of us in our lives. And being in control of us means that He is filling us. And when He fills us, He doesn't just fill us to the brim. I take a cup of coffee and I put it under the Keurig cup and I know that it's not going to overflow. The old pot you'd take and you'd pour and you'd pour just so far and you didn't overflow. But the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ is not like a cup of coffee that you just fill up almost to the top to take out of. There are those that want just so much of Jesus. I remember well a young lady when I was in college saying that in her life she come to accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And then she come to recognize that God, the Holy Spirit began to convict her that God didn't just want part of her, God wanted all of her. And she said, I, re I realized that I had given the living room and the dining room and the kitchen and the part of the house where I wanted everybody to see, I had given that to God. And then I said, God, take the bedroom and take everything else in the house. And said, so I began to look at my life and I, I, I began to realize there's a closet back over here that I keep wanting to run to. There's things 
that I still want that I keep running to in my life. And said, so I finally came to the place that I said, God, take it all. I give it all to you. And my entire being now is focused on Him. That is a devoted heart. That is one that's given all. Mary was one that had nothing from a family that had nothing. A twin could not go, look, did not look like she was going to be able to go to college. She left North Mississippi, went down to Clinton, Mississippi, Mississippi College, walked in the registrar's office, said, I'm supposed to go to school here. This is where the Lord would have me to be. I don't have a penny. How can you help me go to school here? And at the end of the day, she walked out with four years of education paid for through grants, work study, and some other thing. I don't know all of it. But she had that kind of faith. She gave it all to God and trusted Him when He was leading her. It would happen. And it did. Four years later, she graduated and everything was paid for in her life, for her college. That's faith. That's commitment. That's the dedication. That's the following of the Holy Spirit within a person's life. That's God dwelling within and showing this is what I desire and somebody trusting him and it happening. The early church was that way. Stand with me in the reading of God's word second, in Acts chapter 2 beginning with verse 41. Luke says, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Man, wouldn't it be great to stand in a congregation and have 3,000 people come forward to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that day? Man, we don't see that anymore, do we? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, day by day, those who were being saved. And then chapter 4. Verse 32, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. I want you to really think about and focus upon the very word today of together. Together. One heart and one soul. You can be seated. The early church impacted the world that they lived in because they listened and obeyed Jesus. They went into Jerusalem and they waited and the Holy Spirit filled them. On the day the Holy Spirit filled them, they began to speak in an unknown language. It was languages that people could understand, but for them it was not understandable. And they began to preach Jesus. And on that day, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit took control of them. They were bold now instead of afraid. Their whole lives changed and they stood up in front of folks where they'd been behind closed doors and literally that was locked doors in the significance there they went in and for their fear of the Jews they went behind closed doors but when the Holy Spirit came they went out and they were speaking the word of God with boldness and they began from that point on speaking the word of God with boldness and many were being saved a second characteristic of this early church was the fact that they were together they were together. But they didn't just meet together in a place like this that they came in on Sunday. They were together in their hearts and minds. They were together in their focus. They were together in their purpose. They were together in worship. They were together in praise. Their whole being was focused in one direction and all of them. Can you imagine all the church being together, focused in one direction and that direction upon Jesus? It's not about what I think and you think. It's not what about what I want or what you want. It's not about what somebody else wants. It's not about what the deacons want. It's not about what the teachers want. It's not about what the people want. It's about what Jesus wants. 
The focus is on Jesus Christ. He has just been crucified. They have seen him alive. Their Savior is alive. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And they gather together. They gather together. Over and over you see those verses there. In Acts chapter 1. In looking at the very beginning, in verse 14, it says that they, the church, and all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The, the women were even taking on a new significance already in the church. And they were all gathered together. In Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together. They gathered themselves together. Paul says in Hebrews, not forsaking the gathering of yourselves together is the manner of some is. Some stay home thinking they can worship and they can grow and they can honor God. They can honor God just as good as when they're with others, when they're together with the church. They can worship God just as good. And yes, they can, but they don't. The reality is, without being with the people of God and the worship of God, we don't worship the way we ought to. If it, we worshiped at home the way we ought to, even as those who come, we walk in this church beginning to praise God and telling others about right then of what God had been doing and praising God for His goodness and His grace and His mercy, we'd be talking about Him even as we walked in the church. We wouldn't wait for Tyler to get up and say, we're going to sing or begin singing a certain song that worships Him and talk to about him. If we were truly together in worship, we would be worshiping every day. We need to be gathered together to worship and praise him. You don't worship him. There are times when I do, but to say that I worship him in spirit and truth like so often that takes place in a worship service, I love to go out in the woods. I love to take my stool, find me a tree, back up against that tree, and take the word of God and begin to read. I look around at all the things that God has created, and I begin to praise him and talk to him. And the things on my heart, I begin to pour out to him. I begin to seek answers as I read his word. I look to him, and I worship him. And when I leave that place and come back, my whole heart is refocused and I'm changed and yet I don't worship him the same way as when I sit with the congregation of God and sing praises to God and worship God it is a difference there it is a difference when we gather together to worship the early church gathered together and as they gathered together the Holy Spirit came upon them it was a group thing it wasn't an individual thing it wasn't that Peter was filled but John wasn't filled. It wasn't that John was filled and James wasn't filled. It wasn't that anybody was left out but each and every one of the believers all the believers that were together together they all were filled. And we see that several times in the scripture there. When they gathered together and they were worshiping and they were praying and they were seeking that a feeling, a fresh feeling came upon their life. And they preached the word of God with boldness. They were together. In Acts chapter 2 verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, they didn't just come together on the first day of the week. They didn't just come together one time a week. But it says day by day, they gathered together, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received with their food with glad and generous hearts. They came together. It was a significant thing that they gathered themselves together. And you say, I'm tired of that word already. Well, we have gathered ourselves together today. Thank goodness you didn't stay home. You didn't have something else became more important. But you gathered together with God's people. Why did you come? To be with God's people? To learn from God? To speak to God? To worship God? Or is it Sunday and that's what you do on Sundays? They were together with a focus in their hearts and lives and they were together seeking God. It was in their heart to seek Him. They came together. Nobody had to get them ready to worship. They were ready to worship. They were seeing the many things that God had been doing and they came praising Him, it says. And they came together to praise Him. It was in their heart. It was in their heart to gather. As one, they came together. 
You remember the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17? He said, Father, as you and I are one, may these disciples be one with you and with me. He said he prayed for the church in the end times for us that he prayed that even we might be one with him and one with the Father, that we might be together in the likeness of Christ. We might be together in our hearts. We might be together in our focus, in our purpose for being that our hearts and lives were loving God, caring for God, focused on God, and we'd be together in that, in oneness. Being in oneness doesn't mean that you're just not fussing and fighting. Being in oneness doesn't mean that we just come together with friends and fellowship and family and we have a good time. Being in oneness in the church is being in the oneness that our hearts and our minds are focused in one direction, one direction only, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's upon Him and Him only that we're focused. You say, we don't have any other life. Well, as a child of God, you don't have any other life. Everything in your life has been surrendered to Christ. That means your home, your family, your children, your grandchildren, your car, everything about you. Your money's already God's. Your possessions are God's. You have just been given them as a steward to God. They are His, not yours. But you acknowledge that. When you said, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life and save me, you said, Lord, you are our Lord and I surrender my life to you. If you did not surrender your life to Jesus, Jesus is not your Savior today. He can't be your Savior without being your Lord. It is one and the same. You confess the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior of your life. The Lord himself, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That means you bow before him as Lord. You acknowledge him in your life as Lord. So you don't have a life to live. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians that we are bought with a price. That the precious blood of Jesus Christ has paid for us. He has purchased us. And we're no longer our own. In body, mind, soul, spirit, we don't have any say so over it any longer. We have given it up. That's why Jesus said, if any man comes after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. You come to Christ giving it all, putting it all before him. And he comes into your life and takes possession of your life. But so often we live our lives like Jesus is not Lord. He's just the Savior of it. And we go and do what we please. It's no wonder we're in a mess sometimes. Because we're not trusting and following the one who has all things in his hands and has us in his hands. And nothing comes upon us except he opens up his hands for it to come upon us. And he's in control as the sovereign Lord. And we're his children. The early church recognized the significance that they were his. And he was theirs. And they came together as one with a focus on Him, praising Him, glorifying Him, speaking of Him, exalting Him, sitting Him on the throne and looking to Him. They came together as one. They were together, it says, in all things. And there in chapter 4, verse 24, when he says there in, in 32, when he says, Now the full number of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and no one said that anything they had was theirs, but it was everybody else's even. That is tremendous significance. Significance. Whatever needs you have as a child of God, when we come together, your needs are my needs. We don't live like that. We're afraid to live like that. You'll soon take everything that I have, and I won't have anything. That's the attitude that we have today, is it not? Instead of caring for one another in every way to make sure each one has all that they need, not all that they want. You see, our wants get in the way. Our wants are much greater than what our needs are. Our wants get in the way of our worship. Our wants get in the way because I want. Instead of Christ and what Christ wants. Our selfishness, boil it down, our sin. Take away the S, take away the N, you've got a great big I. That's the best definition of sin I've ever seen. Is I do what I please, when I please, as I please, and I'm the focus of it all instead of God. That's sin. 
eye. It's not about eye. It's about Jesus. Look what he's done for us. He's proved his love once for all. You see, they didn't take the life of Jesus. Jesus gave it. They didn't spill his blood on Calvary. Jesus poured it out. It's a big difference. They didn't take his arms and slap them down and put the nails in it to take his life away. He opened up his arms and said, here, and took the nails. He took my sin and your sin when he took those nails. And he says that he loved the Father. The Bible doesn't say he loved us enough to give himself. Jesus went to the cross in obedience to the Father, loving the Father who loved us. <coughs> Enough that he opened up his arms and took the nails for us. Once for all, he said, I love you. I care for you. And I give you life. But he didn't stay on that cross. They put him in a tomb. Three days later, that tomb opened up and he walked out. There's great significance in the thing that he's alive. Our Savior walks with us and talks with us. He leads us. He directs us. He goes in front of us. He goes beside us. He goes behind us. He's all the way around us. There's not anything that takes place in our life that Jesus is not in control of. Well, how can God be such a loving God with throwing all the things in my life that take place in my life, somebody might say. And your focus is on yourself and very possibly, even as David, many of the consequences of David's sin kept on being even after he was forgiven. Many of the consequences of sin are there and you can't get away from them. You can't get away with sin and you can't get away from the consequences of sin, even though we're saved. Many times it's there because of the glory of God. He just decides to do something great in your life and through your life that he might be honored in a greater way. And he lets that and allows that to come in but he's sovereign in everything that takes place the Bible says that God works for our good and his purposes in our lives he's God not us that is the focus and when Jesus has done all that it should be easy for us to love the Lord thy God with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul with all your strength it should be easy for us to keep our focus on God and not upon this world and not upon me and my wants not always my needs but my wants upon me the early church understood the significance of being together when we're together, we can't be in oneness if you're here for you and I'm here for me. We're not in oneness because you have your desires and I have mine. We're not in oneness. You have your ideas and your background and I have mine. They're not the same. We have the things that we see that are significant in our lives or not significant. And they're different. Each and every one of us. The only way there can be a oneness when it comes to being in the child, being children of God in the church is, is that it's about oneness is in Jesus Christ and and him alone and it's what he desires what he wants where he leads that's the most important thing in our lives the early church understood that I have watched through the years as churches came together as the people began to focus in prayer upon God and worshiping and drawing near to him and desiring his will within their lives I've watched as that little small group that began to gather together began to grow people who were not even invited in began to come in people who were not in, involved in the church at all began to come to church people who were lost began to seek out the Savior just because the church began to get together and as they got together they praised and worshiped and they brought together their prayers and they poured their hearts out to God but their focus was on God and they were pointing people constantly toward God together they were pointing people to God the law in the Old Testament said that one person could not be a witness in the case of someone who had murdered somebody or someone who had, had taken something. That one person could not be the witness that per that person was condemned only on one witness. There had to be two or three witnesses before a person was condemned in the law. Have you ever seen and noticed that when God is speaking to you, he may speak to you in a message from the pulpit. He may speak to you in the Sunday school class, but he 
then may speak to you through a friend. He may speak to you as you read the word by yourself. But it's not just one time that God speaks to you, that God says, this is my desire, that God puts a convicting heart, a convicting spirit within your life. It's not just one time that you hear that. It is two or three or several times because God follows his law even. That there he speaks to us. And as he speaks to us, he doesn't just say it one time. He says it many times. Throughout the Bible, he says it many times. I am God and you are not. I am the all-sufficient one, the great I am, and you are not. I am the Redeemer, and you are not. I am the Savior, and you are not. I am the Provider, and you are not. I am the Protector, and you are not. I am all things to you. I am here as all things, as all things to you. Trust me and focus your attention and give your life to me. That's the oneness the early church had. The definition of church that in the early years as I began to study, the church is the body of baptized, a body of baptized believers gathered together to carry out the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. Every significant part of the definition of who we are points to one thing, the oneness that we are in Christ. A body, one body, many members, one body. Believer, baptized. Baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, but baptism in the sense that that's the door to church membership. That's the reason we're significant as Baptists as many others. We don't accept baptism from another denomination. Because it's baptism into the church. A door of membership. All of us come the same way. As baptized in Jesus Christ, made alive in Jesus Christ, but we're baptized into the church membership even. And it's significant we all come the same way. As believers, only the redeemed. You may be sitting here this morning, but never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Your name may be on the church roll, but you're not part of the church. The church is made up of believers, those not just believing that Jesus existed and Jesus died on the cross, but believers are those who have faith and trust and put their faith and trust in him, and he is their savior. They're gathered together. They choose to join each one, yet different, yet each one giving and becoming a part of the whole. They gather themselves together. Equal privilege and responsibility for the work. It's not the preacher's job. It's not the leader's job. It's not the teacher's job. I looked out this morning as I drove up, and we've got a lot of yard here, 19 acres, and we, I'm thankful we don't have to cut grass all up on that mountain up there. I tried to run a bush hog up it, and I tried to run a lawnmower up it. You can only go so far, and it'd have to be done by hand. I'm thankful we don't. But down here, what we do? Well, we do run a lot more. There's a lot of area today that's not been cut. God has somebody in this church that God has placed in their heart and life a desire even, a willingness there to take the step to be. That's part of the body. There's a list out here of needs in our children's department. Praise God, we have the children that we have. We've got a life ahead of us as a church because of all the children. If we have those children back there, God has somebody for every position that is on that board back there, or either we don't need that position. God has already called out, set aside, put us here together to make up every part of the body and for us to fulfill it. And when we're gathered together as a whole, but each one doing its part responsible for the whole and privilege of doing for the whole, everything works out to where you don't have a need like that. Miss Vicki is not back yonder wondering who she's going to get next Sunday for, or Wednesday night for something. She's not back there saying, I'm going to have to take this week after week. Not even thinking about it because somebody feels God leadership and guidance and knows I'm that part of the body together to carry out. That is the performance, the active engagement. That's participation. That's not receiving all the time. That's the giving. You don't carry something out. You don't carry the trash out sitting in your easy chair. You don't carry out the work of ministry sitting at home. You don't carry out the work of the church sitting on a pew. 
It's carried out. The mission and ministry of Christ, that's the purpose of it all, the focus of it all on Jesus Christ and what he desires. That's the very definition of the church. Why is it that that is the one thing so often that we're not focused on? We're together to come together to worship. But are we together in spirit? And are we together in focus that we're here for the purpose of Jesus Christ? We say to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, to carry the gospel to our neighbors. We're here to live out, to be the church in our lives. The early church in being the church went about door to door every day talking about Jesus. They were gossipers. The word preach and their preachers is literally the same word that would be used. They were gossipers. But they weren't gossiping about somebody's bad traits or what some good things individuals were doing. They were gossiping about Jesus. Oh, that we'd become gossipers of Jesus. You know, the focus of our life on Jesus. And when we gather together, we gather to gather around Jesus. We may have had pain and heartache throughout the week, but Jesus, our Savior, has been with us. And we're going to gather together with a church that's going to lift us up and love us and put their arms around us that we might feel the presence of Jesus. Oh, that that was true with us continuously. When we leave out of here today, we're going to leave going in different directions. But the early church, when they left going in different directions, went together because they were going out to carry the gospel to the people they come in contact with. And whenever they met with one another throughout the week, they were together. They talked about what Jesus had been doing and what he was doing. And they talked about Jesus and the sufficiency of Christ. They talked about Jesus. That's the oneness that we have, and that's where we come together. It's around Jesus. They were united in Jesus. Paul said in Ephesians that we have one body. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, he says we have one body. There is one calling. There is one spirit. There is one hope. There is one Lord. There is one faith. There is one baptism. There is one God and Father of all who is through all and in all. There is oneness in the Heavenly Father. There is oneness in the very terms of the church. There is togetherness when it comes to the children of God. And when the church comes together, the church is going to impact the people's lives around it. People are going to want to be a part of it. If we, the church, would just come together with our focus on Jesus. Where's your focus this morning? How much are we really united? It begins with our relationship with Jesus. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? Or is your name just on the church roll? Have you trusted him with your life? Have you surrendered your life to him to be the Lord of your life and the Savior of your life? Do you trust him that you're saved today? Though you might have been saved when you was nine years old, you walked down the aisle, are you still saved today? Yes, in the word of God, yes. If you trusted him with your life, you're still his. Is your relationship right? Is your fellowship right? You see, sin enters into our life and when sin enters our life and dwells there, he's not, he's still there. But the conviction, the guilt, the pain, the miserableness, because we're outside fellowship with Jesus. You can't be in oneness with others when you're outside fellowship with Jesus. If God is at the top of the triangle, and I'm on this left side at the, at the point of the triangle, and you're over here on the right side. In our lives, I trust God and I'm drawing close to Him. If you're over here trusting God and you're just a child of God, but the more that I draw close to Him, I may pull away from you. It's not that we're getting closer together, but I'm getting closer to God. But when you start growing in your life and you're growing up becoming more like Christ, we're getting closer and closer together. When I'm walking with Jesus and I'm walking close to him, I'm walking the closest with you. In your home, when a husband and wife are children of God, when you start out, you're a long ways from each other. You love each other, you care for each other, but you're on the points of the triangle. 
When you start loving him more, you start loving each other more. That's just the way he is. Love is not in the fellowship and the, the, the romance and all the things that take place between you. The love starts first and foremost with your love for God. And the closer you get to God, the more that you love each other. And the more you love each other, the more you love him. And the closer you want to get closer to him. And nothing can separate you. You let one of you start getting out of fellowship with God and you got problems. You let both of you start getting out of fellowship with God and you got trouble. That's just the way it is. It's the same thing in our lives as Christians. When we're in close fellowship and he's in control, we're loving him. And when we're loving him, we're going to love each other. Do you love him with all your heart, soul, and mind? Are you in oneness with the church? The other believers, the saints, we're not sinners. We're saints. That's what the Bible calls us over and over. Saints who sometimes sin, but we're not sinners. Sinners are lost on the way to hell. Saints are set aside, called out ones for the purposes of God, for Him, for Him. And together, we've been placed here in this church. Together, we're part of the one body of Christ here. Together, but did we come together and are we together with our total focus on Jesus Christ? If not, get your heart right with Him. And your heart will get right with your brothers and sisters. Your heart will get right with the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. Get our hearts right with Him and we'll come together. And we'll see the great things that God has. Daily those were being saved and they were added to the church. Oh, that we'd see that in our lives in this community. Father, speak to us, draw us, do your work. Let your will be done. And may we say yes as we choose to focus on you for your glory, for your honor, for your kingdom, for your church. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. As we stand and sing, the altar is open. Get things right with God. You need someone to help you. I'll help you to come to Christ that he's your Savior. You have questions there. Your membership's at another place, but God would have you to be. He's been placing you in this body. This is where you're supposed to serve him. Now's the time to say yes, Lord. Yes. And you join the church. Whatever God would do, whatever God would say, do that and nothing else, nothing less, but nothing more. Sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow.
Thank you for the blessings and the time we've spent with you. And Lord, we're so thankful that we've heard uh, your word this morning and that uh, you had a message for us. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, it spoke to someone this morning. And now as we take up the offering, we pray that you'd uh, the people would give as you've given to them and that they give back to you. And that you'd use this to the upbuilding of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.
me encourage you. It's summertime. People are on vacation. We're without a pastor. When the shepherd's away, the sheep will stray. That's truth. During this time, you look around and you see someone that's not here. They need to know somebody cares. That's up to you. For us to be together is to let each other know, I miss you when you're not here. And so as God impresses on you this week, it doesn't take much. You folks love to hit them fingers. You know? You send those texts and those messages and do Facebooking. You know, there's over 2 billion people in this world that are on Facebook. I had no idea that many folks all over the world on Facebook. You can get the message out there if you want to get it out there. But some of us just don't do all that. A phone call makes a difference. A card makes a difference. But as you feel led and is impressed this week and coming weeks, as you look around and someone's not here that you know normally is here, they may be in the nursery. But if you miss them, let them know you miss them. It means a tremendous amount when one of us reaches out and says, I miss you. Where you been? And so let's be together and stay together during this time seeking Jesus. All right, guys, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, be in prayer once again for our mission team that will be heading off to Nicaragua. Uh, just pray that God would uh, continue to empower them with the Holy Spirit to share His Word that they're going to be doing this coming week. Uh, also, ladies Bible study Wednesday night will be continuing their study of Jonah and also men's Bible study. Uh, if you're new with us, those are uh, two great Bible studies to uh, get plugged into. I know, um, I know that those are going really well. And also, uh, there's some places to serve in the children's ministry. Um, if you'll grab one of these bulletins on the way out and look on the back, there's a lot of various uh, areas to serve in the children's ministry, or you can see Vicky about those. Um, the youth are continuing their study of James Wednesday nights. Uh, if you have a if you have a kid who is seventh through twelfth grade, uh, I encourage you to take them to that. Bradley's doing a great job up there. And also, there will be no Sunday night life until September. Just remember that. And just above all else, just be praying about where God would have you serve uh, in this church and where He would have you be placed. Um, be in prayer about that. And I just want to encourage you to keep. Uh, Keep sharing the love of Christ and oneness as Tom talked about this morning. At this time, I'm going to let Tim close us out, and we're going to close out in a special way this morning. Okay, so I'm going to ask Josh to come forward, if we would. For those of you who don't know, um, Josh and Stacy are uh, about to embark on a, a journey this year that can be trying on a, on a relationship and a marriage. And... Um, if you didn't know this, Josh is about to deploy with his uh, National Guard unit to Jordan. Is that correct? Jordan um, for a year. For a year. And um, as many of you have done in the past, I know John and Tommy and a few of y'all have deployed before, and uh, that can be a, a whirlwind of emotions um, on, on an individual. So um, y'all did a real good job before, so I'm going to ask you to do it again. If y'all would come down, um, we're going to lay hands on Josh and Stacy and uh, lift them up in prayer. Um, Tyler has asked uh, Jeff to pray over them, um, but I'm gonna change it up a little bit. If Jeff would allow me to start it out, I would love to, to pray over them as well. Um, so I'm gonna start it out and let Jeff... Say again. We did. So I'm gonna start it out and then Jeff will close us and then we'll uh, be dismissed after this. Definitely, Father Lord, I just... Uh, I lift this family up to you this morning. I lift up Josh and Stacy, and um, with this upcoming year, um, it'll be a trying year, Lord, but I know that um, with you, all things are possible. Um, I lift up Josh and his safety. Um, I, I pray, Lord, that you'll deliver him um, there um, safe and that you'll, you'll watch over him and protect him while he's there and that you'll bring him home safely. I pray, Lord, that you'll use this church to minister to his wife while he's away. Um, that he can have comfort in knowing that, that, that she's taken care of and, and that he can focus his thoughts on his mission while he's there. Um, I pray, Lord, for his leadership and for his unit. I pray, Lord, for his NCOs and officers above him that uh, you'll just guide them and give them the wisdom to make the decisions that they need to make and 
um, Josh's well, that you'll give him the, the, the wisdom to make the decisions that he needs to make. And I pray, Lord, that um, through this next year, whether Josh finds himself in a valley or up on a hilltop, Lord, that um, I just pray that he'll know that you're there with him. I pray, Lord, that he'll know you're walking right beside him, as Tom said earlier, um, and that you'll just protect him, that you'll keep his, his, uh, his motivation up and, and that he'll uh, uh, know that it will come to an end, even though a year is a long time, and uh, um, that he'll just keep his eyes on you, Lord. I pray the, for his protection once again, and I thank you, Lord, for this young man and his patriotism to this country and his ability to stand up and go where his country's called him to go. And I just pray, Lord, you'll watch over him and his unit. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today, Lord, asking for prayer for Josh, Stacy, our family, Lord, as he's away. His family, Lord, his mom and dad, brothers and sisters, Lord, we just pray that they'll find a peace, Lord, knowing that you've gotten control of this. And Lord, we just pray that uh, we'd all remember, Lord, Josh and the Nicaragua Mission Team, and even our church, that you've called us for a reason, and that's to spread your gospel, Lord. It doesn't matter if we're in Jordan. It doesn't matter if we're in Aniston or Nicaragua, Lord. We just, we're supposed to live a life pleasing to you. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you just be with us. Guide us, Lord. Protect Josh as he's away, Lord. Just uh, let, him, let him be reminded daily that you love him, Lord, and he's got family and friends praying for him. And Lord, we just ask you to just be with us as a church during our time, Lord, of uncertainty. Lord, that we not forget that you're in control. You've got this, Lord. And it's up to us just to let go and let you have it. And Lord, we just pray that you just be with us as a church, but that we'd be found faithful serving you and doing the things that you've called us to do, Lord. We ask all these things in your precious holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen.